uh, UC Berkeley. Um, he co-founded and was CTO of Digital Fontaines. He was VP of technology at uh, Qualcomm Technologies. He co-founded and is currently CEO of uh, Bitripple. He got uh, many awards for his research in general, uh, numerous prize uh, for, uh, for uh, his research paper in distributed computing, information theory, coding theory, transport technologies, cryptography, etc. And uh, today we'll talk about a liquid networking approach to delivering the metaverse. So Michael, you have the floor if you can show your slides. Thanks. First, I had to unmute. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, let me uh, see if I can share the screen here. I think that's going to work. Hold on just a second. Can you see? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, great. Just figure out one thing here and move this off to the side. There we go. Okay, great. So thank you for inviting me to give this talk. It's, uh, it's uh, my pleasure. So today, yes, I wanna speak about the liquid networking approach to delivering the metaverse. And as mentioned, uh, my, my most uh, time consuming role right now is CEO and co-founder of BitRipple. And I will speak a little bit about what we're doing here at the end, but I want to kind of first set the stage. So, um, you know, six months ago, eight months ago, a year ago, you talk to people and you ask them what the metaverse is and they had no clue. Uh, today, I think everybody probably has heard of it. Um, it was all came from this uh, book. I don't know. It's a really uh, sort of a dystopian book, but it's called Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. Uh, it was written back in the 90s. Um, I read it many years ago. I reread it again pretty recently, uh, but it really does describe the kind of this basic idea of a metaverse, especially in uh, a dystopian society where everybody is, is not so happy in their real world. Uh, but anyway, what this really is, is kind of a rich and complex universe where AR, VR, XR, volumetric video media is uh, kind of key. And it's really kind of this virtual universe where people kind of live and play and interact with each other, uh, in his book at least, uh, to the point that it's uh, just as real or and in some sense even more real than the real world. Um, and the, the, one of the key ideas is that the players are actually not physically inside of this universe, of course. They're geographically distributed in, in reality. Uh, but the interactions within this metaverse are highly interactive in the sense that they almost feel like they're in the same space or room together, interacting with each other. So it provides a very kind of life-life experience. It feels as if it were real. So we're still a long way away from this, but that was kind of the vision in this uh, snow crash. And that's again, where this term metaverse originally, I'm not sure that Neil Stevenson came up with the term metaverse, but it certainly is the reason everybody talks about it now because it came out of that book. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the first uh, sort of theme of this talk. The second one is this liquid networking approach, uh, which is, uh, Essentially, it's when you want to deliver data, you convert it into what I call liquid data. So it's actually the liquid data that's delivered through the network and liquid data that's cached in the network. And it's called liquid data because the liquid data packets are fungible, they're interchangeable. So data can be recovered from any portion of enough liquid data. So it doesn't matter which portions of the liquid data that you receive, it's just important you receive enough. And I'll talk a lot more about that in, in, the, in the later part of the talk. Um, so the goals to kind of merge these two things, the metaverse and the liquid networking approach, is to use the liquid networking approach to deliver this metaverse experience. And so what's really required to deliver this metaverse experience, you need to deliver uh, data at very high data rates. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about the, what those data rates are in the, in the future. 
um, with really ultra low latency. And that's really key. The ultra low latency is really important because uh, you want it to feel like as if though, again, everybody's in the same room interacting with each other, uh, they're, they're, even though they're geographically uh, dispersed. By the way, I'm more than happy to take questions as we go forward. I'm not sure I'll take the whole portion of my time. We'll see. So let me just talk a little bit about more about the, the metaverse at a high level. Um, there, there's been a lot of uh, press recently about the metaverse. Uh, this is a slide that was put together by one of the folks who was studying this area. And so these are uh, some kind of snapshot of the companies at least that he sees that are playing in this metaverse and uh, in, put into different categories from delivering the experience like Fortnite and the Antique and Riot Games and so on, Nintendo, uh, to Discovery to creating the economy. Uh, so Unity is important here. Epic Games is very important. And you know, a lot of these others are as well. To spatial computing, to decentralization, to human interface, to infrastructure. So all these players play key roles in this. So uh, there was a... Uh, uh, a, a metaverse primer that was written by Matthew Ball that was published back in June of uh, this year. Uh, it's a nine part primer that kind of gives an overview of different parts of the, uh, the different components of the metaverse in his view at least. Uh, and the one that was most interesting to me was this part that was called networking and the metaverse. Um, and so in that part, there were some stats that he put out there. Uh, which I, you know, you don't have to take them at hard face value, but you, that I, I kind of have gone out and validated these numbers. They seem to be about right. And so, uh, so right now, the, the closest proxy to the metaverse is really online gaming. And so there were some stats about when do uh, hardcore gamers get frustrated? And hardcore games get frustrated, at least in this published study, when the latency is more than 50 milliseconds. That means between the time that they take an action till they see the reaction to that action. So uh, 50 milliseconds is, is when things start getting frustrating. And even sort of casual non-gamers who are playing games get pretty impeded when the, the uh, latency grows to 110 milliseconds. And then for some of these games, they become completely unplayable if the uh, latency grows beyond 150 milliseconds. So these are the kind of latencies that we're talking about for metaverse applications. In fact, uh, for headsets and so on, there's even tighter latencies. Uh, if you move your head and the universe doesn't, if you're on a head mounted device and if, if it doesn't react within 10 milliseconds, uh, people tend to get sick from the experience and, and <laughs> obviously don't wanna play anymore. So, and then for other kinds of data delivery, the latencies are probably not quite as tight, but overall this kind of gives you the idea of what kind of latencies we're talking about. And so this is uh, kind of really one of the challenges. Um, in this same study, he also published uh, some results about uh, what, what the business impact is on latency. Uh, I think you need to take this with a bit of grain of salt because this was, uh, based on uh, data published by a company that he had invested in. But nevertheless, I think it is interesting. Uh, so it, this quote in particular says, every 10 millisecond increase in latency reduces weekly playtime by 6%. So the challenge is really to deliver this metaverse experience, which is really interactive and immersive um, while at the same time providing uh, an experience where the end users are not tethered to their desktops, they, you know, they need to be mobile. Um, and as 5G networks are being deployed and uh, Wi-Fi 6 is getting out there, the networks are getting to the point where they can support the kind of delivery rates that are needed for the metaverse. But nevertheless, um, if, if, you, if you see a lot of the uh, demos right now that companies put on where they kind of show this metaverse experience, 
Um, in a lot of cases, they've got the content all preloaded down into the headset uh, because they don't trust the delivery over the internet. It just doesn't work reliably enough to trust that for a demo. And, and so there is a challenge in, in moving from um, these demo kind of experience to something where it's really deployed and working. Um, so the data rates that we're talking about range from 10 megabits per second to beyond one gigabit per second. And that's the delivery rate to each end user that's in this kind of metaverse experience. And the latencies can range anywhere from, depending on what the data is and what the application is and so on, from one second down to less than 10 milliseconds. So uh, today networks do not support metaverse experience and mobility using existing delivery solutions. So that's one thing that we're, we are really focused on at this point. Any questions or thoughts or comments? Okay, let me move on then. Um, so, but the delivery for the metaverse is, is not good at this point. So actually, I don't know, probably some of you may have seen this. There was a uh, NSF program solicitation that kind of emphasized this point is put out in April. It was an unusual solicitation in the sense that it wasn't just some of the government agencies like NSF and uh, Department of Defense and this that were sponsoring this, but also a consortium of, of, of companies. And in this case, these nine named companies that put in their, their names and, and money into this funding. And if you look at the call for proposals, it doesn't say metaverse, but if you read what the language is, it's exactly describing the metaverse. And they basically say that uh, today's, um, it doesn't support it very well. And so that's really the focus of this research. So the metaverse delivery challenge, um, as I mentioned before, uh, mobility is important, but when you have mobility, you're delivering over wireless networks, so you have variable signal quality. And you're also, you, uh, of course, using shared networks. That's what the internet is all about. In, in shared networks, you're always going to hit some intermittent congestion every once in a while. And both of these cause some amount of packet loss. And using existing delivery solutions, this causes a lot of variable variability in the delivery latency. It's too high. Uh, so it can be low for a while, but then it can go up and down, and, and this doesn't cause a, a very good user experience. So this is really one of the key issues from our perspective. So let me talk about this liquid networking approach for a while. Um, by the way, so I guess we're, we're meant to um, end at the top of that hour. Is that correct? Yes, yes it is. Okay, cool. I will tell you, let's say, 10 minutes before. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so this liquid networking approach is based on um, using um, an erasure code, in this particular case, the Raptor Q code. Um, and the essential idea is you take a, a block of data. So in this example here, the block is consists of these uh, light blue packets at the top. So you've taken this block of data and in this example, you've broken up into 10 equal sized pieces of data, which uh, fit nicely into a packet. So for example, a typical IPv4 packet, you can fit around 1,000, 1,200 bytes of data in each packet. So that's how you break it up into these uh, source packets. And then you use the, uh, the, for example, the Raptor Q code to generate additional what so-called repair packets. Um, so are those, those packets uh, are pieces of data that are the same size as the original source packet data. Um, and so the idea is that the data in these packets, which we call liquid data, it, the reason it's called liquid is because all these, these liquid data packets are interchangeable with each other from the, from the recovery of the data block. So if you send these across the network and only some of them are received, but not all of them, the key property is as long as enough of these liquid data packets are received, you can reliably recover the original block of data. And so again, it doesn't matter which of these packets are received, it just matters that enough. And so it has more properties of a liquid than a solid. Uh, in contrast, the usual way of delivering data 
is you send the original pieces of data in packets. And then you, if, if some of them are lost, you get signals back from the receiver saying, hey, this piece was lost, resend it. And the sender will resend that and, and, and the keep repeating this process until that packet is reliably delivered. Um, in contrast, this is more kind of a, a liquid kind of solution here. And one of the keys is to, uh, we're going to use this kind of approach to really minimize the delivery latency. So it's key that the encoding and decoding speed um, uh, when you're generating these uh, repair packets and when you're recovering the original block of data from the received packets, uh, it's crucial that these encoding and decoding speeds are really, really fast. And the reason is because you just don't want this processing to get in the way of um, adding latency and using up CPU resources. Resources you want it to be as low cost CPU as possible. So, um, so um, we have um, there. There are implementations of this. For example, the Raptor Q code that we're using just a single processor of a standard uh, CPU. You can encode and decode at many gigabits per second. And so th this is uh, make sure that these. Uh, CPU requirements are much are, are pretty uh, minimal compared to um, just sending the data without coding. So on the bottom here, there's a bunch of uh, references. Uh, probably the most in, uh, relevant to this liquid networking approach is this liquid data networking paper that John Byers and I wrote that was uh, back in the, the ACM conference on information centric networking a uh, little over about a year ago, a little more than a year ago. Uh, and then just for reference, uh, there's a huge number of um, uh, references to Raptor codes. There's earlier generations of Raptor codes. There's uh, the original Tornado codes and, and earlier works on that. Uh, so instead of giving all of those references, I just gave a, gave a reference here to the uh, monograph that describes all this, the, the one by Amin Shak Rolahi and myself, uh, the Raptor codes that's in this uh, Foundations and trends in communication theory, and then the the the, the Raptor Q code itself is is a standard. It's fully specified in the IETF. There's RFC sixty three thirty that was published back in uh, two thousand eleven. So there you can get a complete description of of what the code is and how to implement it and so on. And then just as an example, this this particular Raptor Q code has also been adopted integrated into the uh, next gen TV standard ATSC 3.0, which is the next digital standard that's replacing the previous uh, digital standard for broadcast TV. And this is just starting to be deployed over the last uh, year or two. There's a bunch of trials going on around the world. So um, getting into a little um, more detail, um, our the, the Raptor Q erasure code, as I said, is specified in this uh, RFC 6330. Uh, the data block is converted into liquid data. You can generate as much or little liquid data as needed from a data block. So for example, if you're sending over a perfectly good network, you may send uh, zero or, or just the size of the original data or a little more. Uh, but if you're, you think you're gonna experience a lot of, of packet loss, then you can generate as much as you need. And so one of the key properties about the Raptor Q code in particular and, and, and all the codes that I've worked on in the past is that there is a uh, linear time encoding and linear time decoding algorithm. And the recovery properties are almost ideal. So for this code, you can always recover from essentially with 99%, you can recover from exactly the same number of packets that were in the original data block. And for each additional packet, the recovery probability goes up by two more nines of reliability. So it's, it's very well reliable. Okay. So as said before, the liquid data packets can be, uh, liquid data can be sent in packets through the network from senders to receivers. Uh, the liquid data can be cached in the network. Uh, you can generate more liquid data within the network if you have enough data to recover the, uh, the blocks of data. And the receivers can recover the data box from the received liquid data. 
So, um, and, and as I mentioned a few times before, it, the, it's interchangeable. So the data block is recoverable from any set of liquid data equal to the block size. And that's kind of the key to uh, sort of reducing the latency of delivery and providing the, the, a much more flexible approach to, to uh, delivering data over the internet. So, uh, we, so in this LDN paper, we uh, pr proposed an architecture for integrating LDN into the internet using uh, any kind of erasure code, actually. Uh, and so the benefits are that it provides resilience to packet loss, uh, can pr provide reduced latency. It can provide improved delivery bandwidth. And one of the keys to this is instead of just delivering data over one interface to an end client, you can deliver over multiple data paths, multiple interface concurrently and kind of aggregate that bandwidth up and sort of speed the download quite a bit. Um, you can provide improved support for mobile clients. So as mobile clients are moving from say reception of within one tower to another tower, instead of having this tricky handover where they kind of have to, you know, a packet's in transit from the current tower to the mobile client and you have to kind of, they just switch just before it gets there. So they have to reach route that to the other tower with the, the liquid approach that's just unnecessary. They can just go and get whatever liquid data is coming from, you know, requested from the second power without worrying about the loss of that one packet from the first power. So it really improves things. And then there's also improved caching performance, which I'll show a couple of examples of. Um, uh, there are, of course, some potential integration overheads. So um, one would be worried about signaling, uh, latency, security, response, and storage. Um, so there has been some work on uh, integrating erasure codes into um, an internet architecture. Um, we don't feel that these really extracted the full benefits. Each has issues with at least some of these overheads. And uh, we think that the, the LDN approach is uh, something that will be, um, you know, provide the benefits that we think it does. So one of the, some of the key uh, points of this LDN, one is, um, so typically uh, over the internet, we are thinking of delivering objects. So one thing to um, be concerned with is how do you, uh, translate an object to a network data name so that you can actually request it and download it and so on. So an object is a unit of data that is useful, a video segment, an image or email or a file. Uh, obviously a packet is a unit of data that's transported or cached in the network. And the mapping is from the object name to uh, a packet name so that you can request these packets to come to towards you. Um, so it is a, a request response paradigm. So, uh, so you need to address how the clients and nodes request packets for an object and how the nodes respond to requests with packets. And obviously there are security considerations. So end-to-end -end object verification and uh, packet verification to prevent denial of service attacks are obviously important. So just to kind of there the, the one of just to think about it a little bit, there's something called uh, NDN, name data networking, which is uh, a really interesting approach that really focuses on delivering objects over the internet instead of uh, sort of the current internet kind of architecture. And th this has been very popular in the information centric networking community for quite a few years at this point. And so the basic idea is there, there's a, a name mapping from an object to source to packets. In this case, there are only source packets in the original proposals. So for example, if an object has name D, then the source packets have names D.0, D.1, D.2, D.3, and so on. And then the request response is the client explicitly requests the packets by their name. So it asks for D.0, D.1, D.2, and so on to recover the original object D. And then there are security uh, put into place. So there's packet verification. So the publishers who are publishing these, these packets uh, sign these packets um, individually and the nodes and clients validate the, the signed packets. 
Um, and then the object verification is the clients accept an object if all of the source packets are valid. So that kind of is how it verifies that the entire object is valid by saying, oh, I've gotten all the source packets for it and each one of those source packets is valid. So there has been a, a fair amount of good work on integrating Erisha codes into uh, an in information-centric networking context. And so this is a, a list of some of those works. Uh, it's not a complete list, but these are some of the more relevant um, works that have been done. And on the top is just showing that uh, an original object um, is proportioned into K source packets. So K is a parameter that depends on the object length and the packet size. Um, and then the erasure code is used to generate a rich, uh, additional repair packets, which are typically index K through some bigger value, capital N minus one. So, a so one of the key uh, things to worry about when you're using these approaches is the uh, coordination strategies. And so what do I mean by that? So, so put, take the client on the bottom left, it's trying to download some, some object, uh, but it's downloading some of the packets from the node on the left and some uh, packets from the node on the right. And what it wants to make sure of is that the packets that it gets through the purple path are different than those that it gets from the green path. Because if they're, if they're not different, then uh, it's downloading redundant data and, and that, that adds to reception overhead and wasted bandwidth and that's bad. So what you so again, what you'd like is that this client, whenever it's downloading from multiple nodes, it's, it's making sure that it gets different data from each of these nodes. On the other hand, for um, caching purposes, if multiple clients are downloading uh, data for the same object from the same node, it's preferable if they all are downloading the, the same uh, packets. And the reason for that is for caching efficiency. So on the right here, there's two clients, these two clients are downloading packets from this right node over these, over these green paths. And preferably you'd like the data to be the same so that um, this node can just cache the response. It doesn't have to have twice the amount of data to deliver to these two clients. It could just use the same data to deliver to these two clients. So there's a bunch of uh, work on prior, uh, prior work on request strategies. So some uh, ask for very specific data. The client asked for specific, specific packets of data by name, um, but it, it, it makes it difficult to enable this common response. Some, some previous work just uh, says, okay, just deliver random data. So a client requests an amount of data packets and the response is randomly generated encoded data. But then it's uh, difficult to distinguish between the common and additive response in that case. And then uh, there's another approach that says the client specifies data it has already received to the node and the response is additional data that will be useful. But this, makes it much more complex and there's um, some other issues with that as well, especially with the additive response sort of property. So what we do in this uh, LDN work is introduce this idea of a SOPI, which stands for Stream Object Permutation Identifier. And simply put, it's a, a pair uh, of integers, a, a positive integers, A and B, each where A is between zero and N minus one and B is between one and N minus one. So it's a very simple concept. Uh, again, capital N is the total number pool of available um, packets for this particular object, right? And, and N can be um, fixed for each object. It doesn't mean you're gonna generate all these packets. It's just the total pool of available packets that you could generate. Okay, so uh, SOP P equals AB defines a permutation in a very simple way. So the first index is just A, the second is A plus B mod N, the second is A plus 2B mod N and so on. So in the simple example on the bottom, we have an object D that's uh, five source packets in size. And let's say that the total universe of available packets from uh, the erasure code is 11 packets for this object. Okay. 
And then you have a uh, soapy P equals three, five. So this defines what we call a stream object. It's identified as D dot P where P is the description of the soapy AB. And that is simply putting these packets in the following order. So the first packet is simply A. The second packet is A plus B uh, mod N. So that's the first packet is in this case, A is three and, and B is five. So the first packet is the, is the pa packet indexed by three. The second is three plus five is eight. And then A plus five is two mod 11 and so on. Right, and so that's the order of the uh, the the data in this stream object d dot p. And so the the simple idea is that SOPIs are assigned to each node, or at least most of the nodes, or some of the nodes. Uh, the client requests a prefix of a stream object associated with the SOPI. So in, in this example here, the, the here's these two nodes again. Uh, they're both trying to download the same object D. Uh, the node on the left has been assigned a SOPI P0. The node on the right has been assigned a SOPI P1. And so when the client requests data from the left node, it, it requests a prefix of the stream object D.P0. And in this case, it requests say K over two uh, packets from, from, the, from this object from the stream object. And then it also requests a prefix of the, from the right node, the stream object d.p1, and it also requests k over two. So if it receives all these packets, it's gonna receive k over two packets from the left node and k over two, hopefully different packets from the right node, and it can use those to recover the original object d. And then the, the rightmost client is, is uh, downloading in this example, uh, uh, prefix of uh, the uh, stream object d.p1 and also k over two. So it's going to request k over two from some other node that's not shown here, but it gets these k over two from this node on the right. And notice that the prefix it requests from the node on the right is exactly the same as the client on the left. So they're downloading the same data. So this kind of gives you the combination of the additive response and common response features that we were looking for. Just checking my time. So some of the desirable properties is uh, you'd like to support large values of K, where K again is the number of source packets in an object. Uh, if, you, you, if you can only support small K, this is forces splintering of objects into many source blocks, which causes uh, some large response overheads. Um, in terms of erasure code properties, you'd like it to be linear coding complexity, uh, even when coding repair packets only. And this, again, is just for efficiency purposes. If, it, if the complexity grows as K grows or as the number of additional packets you generate grows, this would not be good in terms of um, something real. Uh, and then support for uh, a number of possible pool of packets, capital N, being much bigger than K, for example, greater than K squared, is important because what you want to do is, is design these SOPIs in a way so that their, their prefixes of these SOPIs don't overlap so that when you're downloading data from different SOPIs, you're not downloading the same data. And it turns out that when N is greater than K squared, um, it, it really makes the design pretty simple. So you can choose SOPIs randomly and there's a paper on the bottom, uh, which I saw a very technical paper that's up on archive, which it was a lot of fun to write, which shows that when you uh, choose these SOPIs randomly, when n is greater than k squared, then it does have this property that you can, um, the prefixes of these SOPIs, uh, a k prefix of different randomly chosen SOPIs are large, very largely non-overlapping. And in fact, it, you can also show you can deterministically design a large set of SOPIs and assign those to different nodes so that you have these deterministic guarantees when you download prefixes of them, where the total prefix size that you download from these different so SOPIs is at most K or some fraction multiple of K it is very small. So there are a bunch of different erasure code choices. So random linear network codes and Reed-Solomon codes are examples of erasure codes that you could use in this design. 
Uh, these codes in particular have some significant complexity and response overhead trade-offs because uh, their complexity grows more than linear as the size of K grows. And especially when you have a lot of repair packets in your, in your uh, that are specified by these SOPIs. Uh, there's another code, which is a fountain code, the bat code. It has reasonably okay trade-offs. Um, the Raptor Q code, which is why we use it to base all our, our, our actual implementations on, uh, is because it has near optimal trade-offs. And it, it's very good in terms of linear encoding and decoding complexity and in terms of uh, reception overheads and so on. So here's, uh, uh, let me uh, see where we are in time. We have 14 minutes. Uh, Okay, let me just go through this one example and then I'll skip a few slides and go to the uh, to the metaverse stuff more. So in this example, you have a uh, object D that's available from uh, the top node, which is the publisher of the of it. And then you've assigned these um, SOPIs P0 to the left node, P1 to the middle node, P2 to the right node on the bottom row of nodes. And then the client um, on, on the bottom left. Uh, knows this, the SOPI of the left node is P0. So it asks for a prefix of the stream object D.P0 and say it asks for K over two from the left node. And it knows the uh, SOPI of the right node is P1. So it asks for a prefix of uh, the stream object D.P1 and again, K over two from there. If it gets all these, uh, if these are non-overlapping uh, stream objects in the sense they don't have any uh, liquid data that's in common between them, then this is enough to recover the original object D. And then the, the right client is going to sort of request half from the middle node and half from the right node according to their the corresponding uh, SOPIs P1 and P2. And so these requests go up to these nodes and they're uh, so the so the node in the middle, actually none of these nodes have any of the data uh, from the stream objects at this point, the liquid data. So they just pass those requests up the stack. The middle node got two requests that were the same for the prefix of the stream object D.P1. So it coalesces that into a single request that goes up the stack. So then the uh, node just be, be below the publisher node gets three requests coming in for uh, prefixes of size k over two of different stream of objects d.p0, d.p1, and d.p2. And so these are coalesced. It's, it knows that, that the bottom node knows it doesn't need um, 3k over two to recover. It knows it just needs k to recover. So it, it shortens those requests going up to the top node to just um, k over three in size. And when the response comes back to that, node just below the publisher node, it can recreate the object at that point and, and then generate on its own the, the request down to the, the three middle nodes. So, the, the, so, this pub, so then it becomes a publisher itself. The one just below the top node now has enough data to reconstruct the object. So now it can generate its own liquid data and supply the request itself to generate the additional data it needs down to the three middle nodes. So it got the first K over three from each, but it generates the additional K over six to, to fill it out to K over two. Okay, and then those, those uh, requests percolate back down to the clients, which allow them to recover the uh, original objects. Uh, while at the same time, the, the middle nodes keep those, uh, preferably keep cached the, the responses they already got. So if there's additional responses coming in from other clients in the future, they can respond with, to those with data they already have instead of having to request more data upstream. So I, there is a load balancing thing here that I can, uh, I think I'm going to skip over, which shows you can really substantially reduce the amount of data you have to cache using this system because, you know, in this example, you reduce it by a factor of five to provide a much better kind of uh, delivery. But I think I'm going to skip over this in the, um, and I'm going to skip over the security because we're kind of getting close to the uh, end here. So in summary, this, uh, this LDN design avoids response overhead so client can make explicit requests the SOP design ensures minimum amount of data needs to be received to recover objects. Uh, it's really interesting and, and fun to uh, sort of 
see how to choose and assign these soapies. So a uh, small number of soapies overall may be possible. So this is uh, sort of a research question that's still interesting, although there's been some work done on already, obviously. Uh, and there was some interest in security that I didn't really talk about here, where we make a distinction between the originator of an object and the publisher. And this seems to be important. And it, it seems like this is a, a interesting architectural extension of the internet that uh, where the benefits of erasure codes are achieved and overheads are, are avoided. So let me go back to the metaverse again. <clears throat> uh, and this is really more the focus of the company that I co-founded, BitRipple. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we're actually doing there. So this is a liquid, liquid networking approach to uh, delivering the metaverse. So um, at the top is shown that um, we have the uh, encoding and decoding at uh, gigabits per second. This is just the implementation of the Raptor Q code that we have. We have an amazing implementation of that. We built this simple product on the bottom where it's a really a delivery using a one-way kind of pipe. There's no back traffic from the receiver back to the sender. So the data flows into the sender. It's broken up into equal size pieces. Uh, it, uh, a certain amount of packet loss protection is put on there by generating repair packets that's delivered over this lossy network. The blocks are recovered at the receiver and the, the data flows out. Um, so this is actually used for some interesting use cases already. So for example, we have one customer that's using this for um, uh, defense reasons. They're delivering data from LEO satellites down to ground stations using a one-way channel. And the reason it's important to have this one-way channel is because the uh, receivers don't want to give away their positions. So they don't want to transmit any packets back up to the uh, satellite. So. That, that's an example of where this is being used at this point. Um, we are developing uh, additional uh, solutions at this point. And one of the key ones is uh, for metaverse delivery is, is shown on the top. So this is not integrated at this point, but we do have research. And this is an example of what the research shows. So on the left, in this example, we're delivering 100 blocks of data. So the, think of these blocks of data being generated in real time. So time going along the x-axis here is uh, when those blocks of data become available, when the block zero, block one, block two, and so on. And so what we did in this simulation is we uh, changed the packet loss rate over time. So we started at zero, and then we ramped it up to 20% that back down to you know, 1% and then slowly went down to zero and then back up again and so on. And in the middle graph, it shows the amount of bandwidth that was used to reliably deliver these uh, blocks of data from a uh, sender to a receiver using uh, our solution versus that of an optimal retransmission-based solution. And so the orange line shows the amount of bandwidth that we use for an optimal retransmission-based solution versus um, our solution. And as you see, as the, uh, and, you know, they're, 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 the, our solution is always a little more than the, uh, the optimal retransmission-based solution, but not by very much. And it sort of follows the curve. They follow each other up and down as the pack of loss varies. <clears throat> the key is on the right, where the delivery latency is, is, is graphed. And at the beginning, as you see, the, uh, the delivery latency when there's no packet loss is exactly the same between the two solutions. But as soon as there's any, in, even a little bit of packet loss, the retransmission-based solution uh, it suffers from a, a significant increases in variability and latency. It goes all over the place. And uh, th by the way, this is the optimal retransmission-based solution. So actual retransmission-based solutions that are out there will probably be much worse than this. So this, this is kind of the, the best it possibly can do that's graphed here. And as you see with, uh, with our solution, the uh, latency, delivery latency stays minimal throughout the entire delivery. And that's kind of the, the key point. Um, and then we're looking forward to, to uh, you know, integrated in flow control and multipath delivery and so on um, into our, our, our solutions. So how would this be integrated into a, a metaverse ecosystem? You have at the top uh, um, a metaverse um, 
server that's still generating all this rich universe of content based on feedback from the end users. And it's delivering that universe down to these uh, end clients. So you have uh, servers sitting right next to the metaverse server that um, deliver the actual content down to the uh, end devices um, using this liquid data kind of approach. <clears throat> So we have a, a pretty cool demo that we put up pretty recently, uh, which is a shows ultra low latency demo. I encourage you to go look at it. It's up on YouTube. I have a link here on the, the right. If you look at it, what we do is we compare local. So it's a real time data stream. Actually, it's pre-computed, but it's, it's made available for delivery as if it was generated in real time. It's a uh, 4K video stream encoded for real time at uh, 70 megabits per second. So on the, it's, this was delivery over Amazon Web Services into a home over Wi-Fi. And um, at the server, the video is made available as if though it was frame by frame, as if though it was generated in real time and delivered. And that's compared against local playback of the same uh, content on, on as if the, if you had it really in, in, right inside of your house. And the, the difference in the latency is almost zero. So they're almost always right in sync with each other. And then if you compare that against using standard solutions like uh, HLS, which is the Apple HTTP live streaming solution that's used pervasively across the internet for delivering uh, streaming data, um, that one has significant legs um, and it gets worse over time. And, and the reason is pretty obvious. It wasn't really designed for this ultra low latency stuff. It was designed for delivering sports to you over uh, you know, the internet where the, the time between when the event actually happens and when you view it can be tens of seconds, right? So um, then th this is one of the reasons that these new delivery sort of solution need to be out there because the requirements are so much tighter. Based on this, we're actually had a few reach outs and we're uh, in the process of delivering another really interesting demo um, from device to device over a 5G network, uh, where in this case, we're delivering 8K video and it's kind of a video conferencing app. And hopefully uh, this will be coming out pretty soon. So that's really it. Uh, thanks for your time and interest. And uh, it's been fun giving this talk. Uh, if you want more information about our company, just go to this website. Um, also, if there's any questions about anything, I'm more than happy to, to answer them. Thank you very much. So yes, are there any questions? Let me, let me start. I, 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 I want, so the, how would you balance or, 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 or measure what, what, what is the impact of the improvement in the networking technology compared to the improvement in the, I don't know how to call it, the, the system solution, the kind of errors your code you present or the, how, what was, what has been the most important uh, impact in, in this last decade, for instance, and in the future, where is, what should we do? Is it more important to in investigate on the technology for networking or we should we work even more and find even a better solution for the system? What, how, what are... So that's a good question. I think both are important, to be honest, right? It's not like you can, if you don't have a network that can support enough bandwidth, then that is an issue. I think one of the issues with networking uh, up to now has been, uh, you know, it's designed for not really low latency kind of applications. If you if you think about it, I don't. Have you heard of this term buffer bloat? No. So what happens is routers and switches. Um, so what happens in them is obvi so obviously they need buffers inside of them to uh, as packets come in. They need to buffer the packets because they can't. You know, it can't be just a, a, a flow through through a, a, through a router. If a packet comes in, it's not ready to send it. It shouldn't throw it away immediately, right? Mm -hmm. So it obviously has to have a buffer there. Yeah. Um, but one of the issues is that um, if the if the packets are coming into a router faster than they're going out, then obviously that buffer is going to grow, right? 
and it can grow significantly. There, there have been people out there who've, who've done this and you know the buffers can blow, blow up from seconds of latency to many seconds of latency. And obviously that's not something good for supporting metaverse kind of applications, right? And so there's more modern uh, packet sort of buffer po policies out there. So in the old days, there were things like red, random, early discard and so on. Those were really good uh, ideas that uh, got some traction. But more recently, there's been some more um, sort of modern things that have been put out there that are much simpler. There's something called CODEL, uh, FQ CODEL, for example. And what this does essentially is it looks at in 100 millisecond uh, time intervals, uh, all the packets that arrive in a 100 millisecond time interval within a buffer, it looks at, at what's going on in there in terms of how long the packets within that 100 milliseconds stay in there for more than five milliseconds. And if there's any packet that stays in there for more than five milliseconds, it starts discarding packets, right? And so it really tries to minimize so there's been more concentration in the networking world also on sort of making sure that buffers are not bloating within the network and causing end-to-end -end delays, right? Because that would really, um, it's not suitable for these kind of applications. If you look at what 5G is all about, one of the keys that they're really focusing on is really minimizing latency because they know how key that is. It's, it's partially, I mean, obviously the bandwidth improvements are, crucial as well in the network. You need to, you know, 3G networks are not going to cut it. 4G are not going to cut it. 5G are much better uh, and beyond. Uh, that's why Wi-Fi 6 is also important. You need more bandwidth to deliver this stuff. But just as important is just as crucial as to kind of minimize packets that are sitting in buffers in the in route from where they're generated to where they're delivered. And that, that is a key area for networking to, to focus on. There are also companies out there that put in, you know, are really focused on this as well, that are putting in their, you know, over overlay networks and doing intelligent routing and all this stuff to minimize delays. So there's a lot of work on that. So there's a, a lot of work that is going on out there to kind of support these kind of applications. Uh -huh. And another, I have another question about, um, okay, now, I mean, we discuss a lot, of course, uh, about uh, diminishing energy and saving energy. And uh, so th this type of technology that, that uh, I mean, of, of solution that, uh, that you propose, it, it could contribute to, uh, to save energy or in, or in some sense it goes in the other direction because it increases the demand of we can play more, we can send more data. So do we con are we consuming more energy with this or could we find a trade-off between the two? Or? That's an interesting question. And I think the answer is TBD. I mean, I think, you know, we, we you know, there's a lot of interest in um, sort of one of the ways to reduce latency is put more compute on the edge. There's a lot of people working on that as well. So you kind of put these compute resources on the edge of the network and deliver to the end clients to reduce latencies. One of the issues with that, though, is that on the edge, there's these servers that they're sort of deploying take up a lot of power, you know, three kilowatts of power or whatever, right? And these power sources are not necessarily available on the edge. So they prefer, if they could, to deploy a little bit farther up, up the stack, so to speak, up, up the network towards the cloud, because they just have more power there. Right, and they, they have more, therefore they're able to do more computation and so on. So one of the possible advantages of this kind of um, liquid networking approach is to be able to deploy a little bit farther away from the edge, but keep this kind of same sort of minimal delivery latency in place uh, to provide a really good experience just, just for the, uh, because that's where you can deploy it more easily and cheaply than, you know, by putting power into the edge, as an example, right at the edge. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other question on, on your microphone, if yes, you can also send the message in the chat. Okay. No? Okay, all right. 
So thank you very much, Michael. And uh, I think that's the end of the day for SSS. And we start again uh, tomorrow. So thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.